Uh, thank you all so much for coming this evening. Um, both Gigi and I extend our warmest appreciation for coming out this evening, right, Gigi? Absolutely. Thanks and, so uh, much. Uh, we'll, uh, we hope to entertain you a little bit and inform, <laughs> inform you a little bit. Um, as a I, I'm a former science educator at Briarcliff um, High School in uh, just down the road. Most of you know where Briarcliff is. Um, and I've lived in Pleasantville on this, one of the tributaries of this stream for 25 years. So as I retired from teaching, I decided I would have a little project to give me some structure to my life, which was to walk and explore this Nanny Hagen Brook and understand it better from where, because one of the little tributaries runs through my, my yard. So um, that was part of what was, drew me to it. It's very local, and I've been walking it for a long time, but now I wanted to get to know it really better. And then COVID happened, so I was walking six miles a day along this stream. So I really got to know it very well. Um, and then, um, anyway, we'll talk also about how Gigi became involved in the project and where it went from then. Gigi? Right. And, well, you were also recording. Yes. And you were walking, That's which right. which turned out to be great because right. then you had all this information when you got back, right? Yeah. I have 528 voice memos <laughs> on my phone because every time I saw something, I needed to talk about it. And I thought, rather than writing it in a notebook, I should just record what I'm seeing. So it basically generated itself from recordings. And then I went home and spent an hour each day just transcribing my audio. Right. And yeah. you didn't think you were going to do anything with it? No, I just did it for my own benefit at that point. It really wasn't any idea of publishing it or anything like that. In fact, I didn't think it was much, much good. No. <laughs> Until he showed it to me. Yeah. And I said, this is great. So um, just to let you know where, what we're talking about, um, I really focused. Um, this is Lake Street in Pleasantville. And then um, Palmer Lane is down the edge of the property. Uh, there's Nanahagen Pond. And the aqueduct that takes water from the Catskill Reservoirs to the Kensico Reservoir uh, runs this dotted line. So it really runs parallel to the aqueduct. There's a wetlands both to the north and the south. Uh, the stream flows from the north down here, then it flows to the west, and then it flows south again down to the Four Corners in Thornwood, where it joins the Sawmill River. Okay, so that's the setting to where, what we're talking about. Um, this is a little couple of pages from the book, because as I was saying, I didn't think it was much good, and I had written some, and then Gigi, I sent, Gigi insisted I send you a chapter, right, Gigi? Right, right. <laughs> we we'll talk about that. So in the beginning, when he asked me to illustrate it, I had uh, shattered my elbow and I had a cast from here all the way to my fingers. So I had one arm. I was so happy to have something to do. Right. And I started sketching. And these are the sketches that I did. And, but I knew it had to be digital. And so... I found that there was as much work putting the images into the computer as there was drawing. So, and then I was working with one hand with my computer like this on the mouse right. and this like this. Eventually I got an iPad and that was, you'll see, it worked, it was great. So the illustrations in my mind really helped me understand that it actually could be something that would work because I didn't really believe that it could work, even. So I, Gigi said, send me another chapter. This was like, <laughs> I said, OK, are you sure? So I think I sent you four chapters to start well, with. Well, I think there was one chapter. But okay. you know what, what it was, what hit me immediately, I said to him, this is very poetic. Oh, I just banged my microphone, didn't I? Sorry about that. I'll try to keep, I try not to use my hands too much. But uh, I, I felt it was very poetic. I don't know if those of you that read it agree with me. and. Uh, I think it's, it's a story that you feel you're walking along, and I felt that. So it was easy for me to find things to illustrate. Yeah. 
So um, one of the first things I talk about in the book are skunk cabbages, which we all know and love. And this is an absolutely gorgeous illustration of, of the skunk cabbage. Can I just say that the first time I did this, I didn't know because I'd never walked in the snow to look for a skunk cabbage, really, you know? And I had it on leaves. And so this gives you an idea of how Michael and I work together. Right. Because I sent him the skunk cabbage on leaves, and he said, no, don't you know <laughs> that in the winter, the skunk cabbage is like, what is it, thermal or something? Yeah, they melt the snow. And it them. melts the snow. Yeah. I don't know, how many of you have gone out to see skunk cabbage? In oh, you have, look at that. <laughs> okay, so then I had to change it. And the challenge was how to get white snow on a white background. And so this little slush in the background, you know, makes it yeah. work. They're really interesting plants, skunk cabbages. They're thermogenic, so they actually heat about 30 degrees warmer than everything around them. So they actually melt the snow in little patches around them. And um, what, they come up in December. And so this was in February. We had a lot of snow that year in February. In fact, we had like 30 inches of snow that year. So it was like astonishing to see them melting the snow around them. So I'd like to read a little excerpt about the uh, skunk cabbages. Um, hundreds of sensuous Skunk cabbage spathes grow tall, but not yet unfurling. Maroon with yellow and brown speckles, or green with maroon speckles. Amazingly, these thermogenic plants, 10 to 30 degrees warmer than the air, melt the snow and ice around them. Two days later, the cabbages have shot up. Hundreds of them, very skunky. Most still closed, but two have opened to reveal the spadix a small sphere covered with tightly packed yellow flowers. Female flowers at the bottom mature first, male at the top later. A dusting of yellow pollen lies on the petals, waiting for an insect to carry it on. No insects here yet. We need a few more days of warmth. So this is the little spadix inside with the yellow flowers on it. Obviously, you all know about and love coyotes, right? <laughs> coyotes are, are big around here. And uh, I met this one coyote as I was walking along the aqueduct one morning. I was walking towards Palmer Lane, and I was standing about here, and then there was a coyote about where the gentleman in the blue shirt is, looking at me from across the stream. So fortunately, I had a stream between us. But this coyote was a big boy, definitely a strong, healthy male. So I turn the corner, and I'm greeted by a truly handsome animal. This is a big boy, at least 40 pounds, a deep rust brown coat, lots of guard fur, fur, large ears pointed and erect. The eastern coyote looks at me with utter indifference, mixed maybe with a little curiosity. Not much fear, though. He takes a few steps towards the reeds, stops and looks back. Then he turns, shakes his head, and sh takes off into the undergrowth. As nature disappears around us, I treasure these precious meetings more and more. Essence is revealed. Each encounter satisfies and heals. Feral is always exhilarating. So coming to draw it, right, Gigi? <laughs> so this is the picture he took of the coyote. So I had reference. And if you notice that the back legs are close together, but I couldn't make it happen. I kept drawing it and drawing it. I couldn't get the light right. So I decided to spread the legs like that. And I was thinking about Frederick Remington, the artist Maybe a lot of you know it. He did bronzes of cowboys and Indians and horses. And one day, someone said to him, a horse doesn't buck that way. And Remington said, well, he ought to. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm not sure if a coyote walks this way, but he ought to. <laughs> Another major character in the book is 
is the beaver who came to live on the stream. And uh, I, I'll read a little excerpt, maybe afterwards. I'll let Gigi talk about drawing the beaver. So just to explain that not every image is exactly the same. This is like a collage, sort of. I started with a photograph of the beaver. And several years ago, a friend of mine, she's here now from Atlanta, came up to visit me. And we decided we wanted to go somewhere, be relaxing, have a meal, and paint. So I took her to a convent in Darien, Connecticut. <laughs> and we painted, and this is the painting that I did on plain air while I was there. And I thought, if I use the back of this behind the beaver, it would look more like a pond rather than having the whole water like that. So the other thing was I turned the tail so that it was more predominant and exaggerated the splash and put light on his head. And I sent it to Michael and I said, I turned the tail, is that okay? And he said, yeah, the beavers do that, but there's something the matter with this drawing. So I've been doing portraits for lots of years. And I know when someone tells you there's something the matter, like they'll come in there and say, the nose is off or something like that. You really have to look. You have to decide what it is that's the matter with the thing. And so it's like John Singer Sargent said, uh, when, you know him, he's a portrait artist from the 1900s. He said on his epitaph he wanted written, here lies John Singer Sargent, you got the mouth wrong. <laughs> so, so I, I, uh, I, I looked at it and looked at it and looked at it and decided what happened was I had put the light here, but I had never changed the background to put the light in the background. So the final picture I think we have there is the light in the background. And now it worked. Wild deer, fat on summer fruits, walk by. The orange setting sun in the western sky disappears. The sky turns inky purple, and the waning crescent moon hangs to the south. In the dark and quiet, the beaver comes out. Remember, I recorded this as I was watching it. Surprised by me, he slaps his tail. And I tell you, when beavers slap their tail, you know about it, OK? Disappears underwater. 20 seconds later, he surfaces and slaps again. Warning shots, but what a great noise. So the beaver was really a friend of mine by the end of this year, a really good friend of mine. Um, I want to talk a little bit about beavers as well, because they've really been, um, I don't know, I think it's appalling what's happened to the beavers in this country. And it happened 300 years ago, I mean, let's face it. It's New York State has, New York City has a beaver on its symbol, I believe, and beavers were all over this part of Westchester. And honestly, nothing around here is the same without beavers, because all of our streams should have beaver dams on them, and all of our waterways should be managed by beavers. So we wouldn't have any floods. We wouldn't have any mass, you know, damage to our anything if we had beavers here helping us take care of the ecosystem. So I really felt that close to this beaver. I'm not sure where he came from because apparently there's no other beavers on the sawmill river. And this is a tributary of the sawmill. There are beavers on the Bronx River, which is just over a crest to where this stream originates at the high point on Deer Deerfield at Bear Ridge, which runs like around the top of this edge of this to the uh, towards Armonk. So he may have come over the top. Beavers don't like to go out of water for very much, so I don't think so. But then where did the beaver come from? It's, it's really a puzzle. And then it disappeared after a year and a half. So where did the beaver go? I don't think we know really at this point. But the fact that they're coming back is really encouraging. Yeah. <coughs> uh, we're co-sponsored tonight, thank you, by the Audubon Society. So I wanted to make a nod to some of the birds that I observed. So 
I saw many birds. I'm not really a birder uh, by, of any knowledge, but I did look them up and uh, use Merlin app quite a bit to try to find out what birds we had. Most of them are pretty common, I imagine. I don't know. Maybe the Audubon Society can tell us if some of them aren't common. <laughs> but um, my, favorite, my favorite bird was um, the gray egret when I saw that by the pond. And we've got some beautiful illustrations of birds. So um, another favorite was the uh, red-winged blackbird. Gigi would like to talk about the red-winged blackbird. Well, so, I, you know, I, as I read his book, I tried to illustrate what was in it. Obviously, I failed with the skunk cabbage. But um, <laughs> you notice he says how they pop up when they sing. It, you know, it's black and white, and this should be red, right? But right. In order to bring it out, I put it white. But the next two pictures, so that's the uh, junco, the, the uh, snowbird. I love that snowbird because, you know, in, in the snow, there's nothing there, but you see them jumping around. They're yeah. so cute. But this is my favorite. I had so much fun. <laughs> I read about this in the book, and I, I thought it would be so funny to put his head in the water. And I said, <laughs> I really had to talk Michael into it because the first thing he said was, it should be a female. But when I looked up the female, like unlike us, the male is prettier, yeah. right? <laughs> but but uh, so I, what I loved about, so the female had all this kind of camouflage, stripe brown on him, her. And I, what I loved about this was just the simplicity of the shapes. It almost doesn't have feathers. It doesn't have anything in it. It's just nice black and almost like an abstract drawing. And I was, I was very happy to just leave it simple. And so. Thank you. One of the other things that I found that really helped me set the tone for each chapter was to put a little piece of poetry in the beginning of each chapter that connected me to you know, to, to words. So this is one of my favorites by William Blake. I'll let you read that one on your own. But uh, also Emily Dickinson, I used her in the next chapter, um, called Insects, Buzz, and Fizz. As imperceptibly as grief, the summer lapsed away. Our summer made her light escape into the beautiful. That's from Emily Dickinson's as imperceptibly as grief, which I think is what we're all feeling right now as summer just drifts away. I'd like to talk about this character. <laughs> so uh, Michael picked up this turtle yeah. on the road. <laughs> on the road. <laughs> right, and carried him 40 pounds, something? Uh, maybe 60. <laughs> maybe 40 to 60. It was, I think it was he's this a big. <laughs> It was stuck in the middle of Lake Street. It would not move. And I thought, this is not a good place for you to be. <laughs> 60 pounds? Yeah, I think wow. so. Maybe oh, 40. Exactly. Definitely 40 to 60, something like that. So, <laughs> Maybe I'm um, exaggerating. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, I thought of, think of myself in a way as a police sketch artist, because I had to match his vision. Yeah. <laughs> so I did a turtle. And he said, no, it didn't that's look not, like what that. <laughs> not what I saw. We have the head is like this. We're going to move the head. We have to move the tail. We have to do this. But finally, yep. we got it together. And it this together. pretty much is what you saw, right? The yep, long tail. Pretty much, yep. yep. And um, when I pick him up, he is not happy, hissing and nipping. He definitely tried to bite me as I picked him up. Obviously, I picked him up behind the shell, because behind the head, because that's how you pick them up. But I stopped traffic on Lake Street while I was doing this. It was dusk, and it was getting dark. But I managed to get him over. And uh, funnily enough, the other um, two months ago, I was in the park, Nanny Hagen Park, and a smaller female had come out and was digging uh, to lay her eggs. So that was really nice, just a couple of months ago. Yeah, and we went on a walk. Yeah. Uh, Michael took some of us on a walk along the brook. Right. And th there was a whole area there where you said that. Yeah, she had been digging. She had and, been digging. And then she right. covered the eggs with soil. Right. That's how they lay their eggs. Um, 
So this was really hard. Yeah, to, I'm sure. This, Can you imagine illustrating this? This is yeah, very hard. Yeah, this, so white <laughs> on white, this is an Indian pipe, yeah. actually Emily Dickinson's favorite flower. Yeah. Although it's not a flower, it's a fungus. It is fungus. a flower. No, it's a flower. Is it not a fungus? No, it feeds off fungus, but it is a flower. Oh. One well, of the most all right, unusual the, flowers around here. The stems are white, the flower is white. Yep. And uh, so this is not true to nature, but what I thought was I would be more designy in this one. So with the rule of three, I've got three separate stems. I've got three going like this and three going down there just to uh, make it more like a, I don't know, design rather than what nature would have done. So I was back there at the same spot um, about a month ago, and again, another little clump was, was, was growing. So in but the they wood, are, they're about that big, right? Yeah, not, not even, maybe so. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, little. In the wood, I find a clump of ghost pipes, one of nature's strangest plants. It flowers all white on gray-white stems and has no leaves. Nourishment is drawn up through the roots, which intertwine with the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. They, in turn, get their food from the nearby trees. It's supposedly a painkiller, but I'm leaving these here. <laughs> this is my favorite page of the book. And um, I'd like to read it to you. Rain, heron, and fox today. The great blue heron fishes at the side of the stream, walking delicately, cleaning and preening her feathers. She shakes out her wings and a few feathers fly off, now down to the serious business of eating. Long, sharp beak darts into the water, picks up, tosses out, darts in again, picks up a morsel, swallows. She stands quietly tall, a little raft of mallards around her. Orange fox flashes out onto the path, sees me and veers back into the woods. Long bushy tail streams out behind as it dashes up the hill. White tuft at the end, over the ridge and out of sight. Goodbye. Fox was as lively as rain. So I'd just like to say about the way this page worked because yeah. the, the editor. The layout. The layout. And the editor <laughs> got involved. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, this is really difficult when you think about it, to make the, the text fall around. And I think that that was, he did a fabulous job. This is a beautiful page in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my layout artist has been working in layout for about 40 years, so he, he knew what he was doing. But Am I right if I say 14 changes? F 14 series of changes, yes. Right. But it, within each of the 14, there was about 25 changes. No. <laughs> so it was 14 but, times 25. But we learned a lot about widows and orphans. Yes, right? widows, <laughs> orphans, runts, <laughs> all kinds of strange words. Um, also saw another beautiful heron there. So when I was reading the book and trying to find something that I would illustrate, he gave me carte blanche. I could do whatever I wanted. And so I tried to find things that had paragraphs because uh, the picture was going to go near the paragraph. I didn't want to have it just, well, I saw this and then move on. And you wouldn't know that the picture went with that one word. But in this case, what does it say? The moon on A the A full water. moon, bullfrogs croak and the coyotes howl. A chunky black crowned night heron stands still at the edge of the pond, waiting for prey. Right. So the only th so that it describes it perfectly, except for the howling coyote. Yeah. That you're going to have to do yourself. Right. So as we're in Chappaqua, I'd like to connect this book a little bit and the area to where we are in Chappaqua. So um, this is the Sawmill River here, down by the Four Corners in Thornwood. Um, this is Broadway that runs up here, and the library is just up here, where we are tonight. Um, I don't want to knock this, but the, tribute, the main stream runs like this, and then up to Monson Pond, Pond, and also up to Old Farm Hill, and this is Old Farm Road. So this is a ridge around the top here. Um, but if you come up through this, there's a big hill here um, to Bear Ridge, 
pond, which is on Lakeshore Drive. And then just north of here is this little area, which is called Apple Farm, which is just across the road there to the south of us here. And I'll zoom in on the next map, which is um, a little bit closer so you can understand this. The Apple Hill Mansion is just up here. And the origin of the Tertia Brook is here. This is the Tertia Brook outside the parking lot here. So just for those Chappaqua residents who want to know where we are. So this is a really interesting part of the um, topography of this part of Westchester. And this might be a little technical, but I got a topo map from Westchester GIS. And you can see the Apple Hill Mansion. I don't know if anybody in Chappaqua knows this. It's a really beautiful mansion. It's up on the top of the hill there. This is the origin of the Tertia Brook, which flows from south to north. And the Nanahagan Brook starts here and flows from north to south. So I, I was there where I met a bear, but we'll get to that in a minute. The little stream comes down from Apple Hill. To the east of the ridge, the water flows north to Tertia Brook and through Chappaqua to the Sawmill River. Where I am standing, the water flows south through Bear Ridge Lake to the Nanahagan Brook and then to the Sawmill River. So one foot either way, and the water takes dramatically different turns or different routes to the same place. Such are the ups and downs of the hills here. So I was on this little ridge, and if you look that way, the water goes south, and if you look that way, the water goes north. And I was right there on that ridge. So, Can we go back to the other yeah. map, the first one? Because I just want to make people notice this. This drove me crazy. <laughs> yeah. I did uh, 45 illustrations, the two maps in the cover. <laughs> yeah. But this drove me the craziest because if you notice, this is Nana Hagen. Yeah. And this is Nanny Hagen. You have no idea how many times I got it wrong. <laughs> and that's all of English bastardization of the Dutch original. Yeah. And if you go further south, there is Nanny Hagen Road, which is further south, which is not anywhere near the Nanny Hagen Brook, but <laughs> never mind. <laughs> So I'd like to talk a little bit about large mammals. Um, we just had a bear incident, right, in Westchester. Um, beaver are coming back. Black bear are definitely coming back. Bobcat are here and have been here for quite a while. Coyotes are doing very well. And actually, there was recently a coyote found in Long Island. So it went across the Whitestone Bridge. <laughs> quite happy. Uh, red fox and white-tailed uh, white deer. Sorry, that's my typo. That's not so, in the so book. So this is yeah. the, uh, what the beaver did? That's the beaver damage, yep, to a 22-inch um, maple. And I watched the beaver during the course of the year take down that tree. So I came first, and there was just a couple of bite marks on one side. And then a few weeks later, a few more bite marks. And eventually the beaver, actually it didn't take the beaver very long. Honestly, about but two then, months. But then what did he do with it? Um, this 60-foot trunk crashed towards its den. And it took the food from the top parts of it and was making oh, a cache for the winter. Okay, so that's, yeah. he took all the branches. Right. This is some deer poop, which I spotted right by Apple Hill Farm. And that told me that the, the I mean, bear poop, deer poop, bear poop, excuse me, bear poop. Yeah, and it's far too big. It was this big, so you know it was a bear. Um, and this is bear tracks that I saw on the aqueduct. So <clears throat> this is a picture taken by my neighbor across the street, one of my um, neighbor's son, actually. He's in high school in Pleasantville, and he's, he was working in the science research program. And he took a, set up a camera trap. And this is on Willow Street in Pleasantville, which is right basically in the middle of Pleasantville. I mean, so don't think they're not out there. <laughs> so um, a little bit about the bears, maybe just to let you know. Um, I spoke to um, a bear, Bud Viverka, who works for Mayanus River Gorge, who's a bear expert. And uh, it was really interesting what he had to say about the bears. Lone males travel long distances, 250 miles in two months. So 
the bears have moved into northeastern Westchester from northwestern Connecticut and from western Massachusetts. So these are actually Massachusetts black bears. They've come down from Massachusetts into Connecticut, and then they've come into northern Westchester. Uh, these bears have moved into northeastern Westchester from northwestern Connecticut and western Massachusetts. Bears need a good-sized, contiguous, undisturbed area in which to breed. We now have that in Ward Pound Ridge, over 4,300 acres, and Mianus River Gorge, nearly 1,000 acres, both about 15 miles from here. Cubs den with the mother for a whole year. Female cubs often stay in den with the mother another year, but the adolescent males get kicked out. So they move south. One came here. Lone males travel long distances, 250 miles in two months. Habituation of bears is a big issue, says Bud. Don't feed the bears. A fed bear is a dead bear. We want these animals to stay wild, but as they come into human contact, opportunities for trouble increase. As it's so late in the season, Bud thinks this male is probably denning in the area. I wonder if I'll see him again. Hope so. And this picture was taken a few months later on my street. So that was kind of like eerie in how that worked. Yeah. Um, this is from my neighbor. I talk about the coyotes a lot. <clears throat> and uh, this is actually a Jim Painter. Where, where are you, Jim? Jim, this is from VJ, who lives right between Jim and I. The stream runs through my property into uh, VJ's and then into Jim's. And this is under uh, VJ's deck. And these are coyote pups. The female leaves the pups during the day to go and get food. But aren't they great? <laughs> there were eight of them. <laughs> yeah. This is like the Bronx Zoo, right? <laughs> OK, this is courtesy of my neighbor on Willow Street as well. And this is the um, bobcat that I got a picture of from another neighbor up by uh, the Bear Ridge, at the top of the Bear Ridge, Deerfield. So bobcats are about this big, <laughs> just so you know. And of course, Gigi illustrated it beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess I had a choice uh, to make him look more ferocious. I think it's a her, but anyway. Uh, okay, to make her more ferocious. <laughs> but I, 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 I just thought, let me make it, well, you know, they're here. Yeah. And we have to learn to live with them. That's right. And so let's make it look like he's not so ferocious, mm -hmm. and maybe we can get along. And right. so. um. I ended the book with a chapter called Winter Returns, and uh, I particularly like this Rachel Carson quote from Silent Spring. The other fork of the road, the one less traveled by, offers our last, our only chance to reach a destination that assures the preservation of the Earth. Yeah. So, this, it, so this image, the last image, and the first image in the yeah. book are the same exact thing, except this is winter because he started in January. In, in January. Yeah. Ends and up this, in December. Stop in December. And I had this idea to make him walking away with his footsteps, and I love that. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's the end. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions and answers? I have a few moments for question and answers. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Just raise your hand. Yeah. I'm curious about your process because so many of the images are so real to me. And I'm just curious what your process was in brief in illustrating them. Oh, I did try to explain. I guess I did do a good job. But, you know, no, no but um, so, yeah, so I'm a realist. I draw, 
and uh, I draw things to look real. And so I use the iPad and I use Photoshop. And Photoshop, I cheated a little bit with cloning and copying and cutting and pasting sometimes when I could. But most of these are drawings that, uh, <coughs> and then, you know, for instance, the night heron. That's a combination of drawing in the background. And then I used the, an image of the, the bird and had to fix him up because he has a tail coming in like a thing. And so I, I, I really don't use Photoshop, but they're beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, once I got Photoshop, and I could, because remember, I'm worth working with one hand, right? So I, I could do it, and I could draw with it, and I could play with it, and made life. And if, if, if every, I have 400 images, so 10 each. They're 45 images, iterations. Let me change this, let me change this, let me change this, let me change this. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but. It, it does, it does. Yeah. Come over to my studio one time and we can. <laughs> Yeah. Sure. Okay. I just want to say that in that particular picture you just referred to, the bullfrog, it has that little, uh, that little croaking um, critter in the corner. Yeah, the bullfrog is in the yeah, corner. The bullfrog and, but what you did to give more personality to this is you had one look at the other, the look at <laughs> And, I mean, that's your choice to do something like that. And I feel that both of you, both of you as the author, as a writer, have given, have each of you has given great personality to each location. Thank you. And I thank you. It's, thank you. it's not just a, a description. It's uh, you put yourself in each of these. Mm -hmm. in, in yeah. Yeah. Yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, there are a couple of themes that you talked mm -hmm. about. One was mutualism. Yes. And the, uh, which I think in some ways is the fact that you collaborated right. is a good example of what Mutualism. you talk about. Yes. Not what you were talking mm -hmm. about in the book. But, and the other one was the impact of invasive species. Yes. And uh, I did a sublime job overall. I thought it was just beautiful. But if you could comment a little bit on those two uh, themes, please. Did, I, did everybody hear that? Sorry. Why don't you repeat it? Uh, I'll, uh, I, I, you yeah, I'll repeat it so that everyone can hear it. Um, the gentleman said that we did a nice job of um, talking about mutualism and the way we work together is very mutual and I, I felt we did that indeed and I have really enjoyed working with Gigi and I thought Gigi's illustrations make the book beautifully. And the um, gentleman also asked about invasive species and I didn't really talk about that very much tonight. but. Um, Invasive species, where do you start? Um, there's a big um, question in the book as I was writing it. I, I wanted it to be uh, hopeful and generally positive about how the big mammals were coming back and about how you know, generally the, this part of the ecosystems were working and that the species were serving each other in, in, a, in, a, level, in a way that they do in food chains. But there are some serious problems with invasive species in Westchester, and, and I talk about that in the book quite extensively. Um, but we're not getting rid of them at this point. And in fact, there was an article in the New York Times two days ago about invasive species. Um, I think there's now 37,000. We've transported 37,000 species around the world. We have done that. We have to remember that it's we are bringing these things around the world and they are causing significant damage. And even here in Westchester, if you look at the roadside, the mugwort is basically taking over our roadsides completely. Yeah, the trees, yeah. you could see there, the right. vines are just all over, right? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yes? So, um, over the course of your time walking again and again through the, the brook habitat, yeah. through the seasons, what, what changed for you? What became different? How did that experience change you? Yeah, well, I think it um, helped me um, see things. And that was the most important thing, is that it helped me observe. And Gigi knows this as a painter, I'm sure. You have to really see something in order to be able to paint it. You also have to be able to see something to write about it. And so it really helped me observe it and to 
closely observe something actually then help me understand um, the difference between past, present, and future, and it actually brought me into the present. So using close observation as a tool to be present was the most important thing that I learned from the whole process. And if we're not present, then we're either worrying about something that's going to happen in the future or bemoaning something that happened in the past. And that's not good to be either of those states. So we really want to be present. So that's what the book did for me. I don't know about you, Gigi. What the book did for you? <laughs> Frustrated you? <laughs> you know, I, when, you, when you were talking, I was thinking about when we went and walked on the brook, yeah. and we got to the beaver dam, and it was all destroyed. Yeah. And I felt so sad. Yeah. You know, I never met the beaver. You did. But I, I just felt like I was thinking about the future when I saw it. And maybe, maybe we're saying something different. Maybe I'm too much in the present, and walking along with you and seeing you know, the de destruction that's happened and yeah. the invasive species and the things. And I, I, I worry about the future. Let me just say that. Yeah. Another question? Yes. Um, yeah, two, two quick points to your points and a quick question. Yeah. Um, so the invasive species, the red-winged blackbird, was on Phragmites. Yes, so it was on Phragmites. Yeah. There's these little benefits. That that's right. Like yeah. Also, thank you very much for your points about beavers and how very important they are for our ecosystem and even as a um, potential, you know, helping with adaptation with mm -hmm. climate change and all that. So um, if you ever have a beaver on your property, please, please learn the right way to treat it and don't just kill it. Yeah. And, um, and then the other one is just my question. You're talking about presence. Uh, how, do you, how are you present enough? Or no, not, that's not the question. How do you see a nighthawk? What, like, it's nighttime. How did you see this thing? Which animal? The uh, night heron. The night the heron? The night heron, yeah. It, it was dusk. It wasn't quite night. And uh, I was out walking with the moon. And that's with a full moon, you full could moon. see. Yeah, yeah full you can moon, see quite a lot. See. Wow. Yeah. Is it yeah. still kind of in the trees? Or like, I just wondered no, it was on the side of the pond. It was on the side of the pond. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. I'm, just, I'm just slightly prejudiced. I okay. really liked the book and the illustrations. And I think, as you were saying, I think it's a very personal invitation to go take a walk in the woods yeah. just around where we're living and a real appreciation of, of what's here in Westchester. Yeah, it's a beautiful part of the, beautifully part of the country, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. There was another question there? Yeah. Just a question to you about the illustration process. Do you do everything directly on the iPad? I was like him. When you're doing your illustration, it starts on the iPad, or do you start with something else and then move it to the iPad? Both. Okay, sometimes I would start drawing, and sometimes I would start drawing right on the iPad. If you can oh, do it, iPad. yeah. Okay. If you, you know, there's different pen points and there's different, you know, so, yeah. I learned a lot when I was doing it, because it was my first time doing it. Yeah. I just want to add to that. I'm knowing you for as long as I have. I'm her brother. <laughs> <laughs> you have done. You have done so many different art mediums, from charcoal to oil paint to pastel. Over the years, you've done still life, surrealism, portraits, and all beautiful. He's my personal. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I really enjoyed in this book. What I really enjoyed in this book was it's the first time. All of your years of artwork where I saw you really do detail, detailed drawings of wildlife and, and that kind of thing. Which yeah, totally new right, right. I, I, I'm, you're absolutely right. I'm a portrait that, painter, still life. That works so well with Michael's prose, I thought it was just phenomenal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't even know how to turn on an iPad. I was really drawing the stick figures. So I'm a little confused. When you say you draw it on the iPad, is there a stylus? Yes. I, it's a pencil. I have an eye pencil. I didn't say that. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. And, and <laughs> along the, there's, there are different points that you can choose. They're thin, they're thick, they're light, they're so run. That's what you were learning is how to use the stylus in an electronic. Yes. Yes. And like I said, 
10 images till I got it right each well, time. It's just exquisite. Thank you. And yeah. I, I love the prose, and I, I think it's a real gift to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Are there any other questions? And that coyote really yeah. <laughs> yes. So you, you obviously did a lot of walking. A lot of walking, yes. How did you, what was your experience with the little hitchhikers that are so great? With the little what? Yes. Ticks. Oh. How did you protect yourself? What was your... I don't protect myself and I didn't protect myself, no. I just sort of went for it. It is pretty jungly back there. It is pretty wild, yeah. I got Lyme disease once, not while I was doing the research for this book, but I probably got it in my garden, but you know, I don't know. I took Doxy and I was Was the question about bug spray and things? No, Is that ticks. what you meant? Lyme. Yeah, because when I went walking with him, I had socks on. Right. I <laughs> yeah, I'm a little more, I'm a little more wild. The only thing I, I didn't have a bee thing around. Connect with the ticks, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So, um, yes. It, for each illustration, was each one a command performance, or did you leave it up to Gigi to decide what she wanted to illustrate? He, yeah, he did. I said, he gave me carte blanche. I could yeah. do whatever I wanted. He really, it was great. Yeah, but I also then was very clear with her if it wasn't right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it didn't match what I saw, I told her, right, Gigi? <laughs> yes, you did. Yes. You absolutely did. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so that was fun. Okay. So I'll leave, this with, I'll leave you with this. Um, despite the beauty... The idea of a virgin landscape here in Westchester is an illusion. With the building of the Catskill Aqueduct, change came rapidly, led mostly by the invasive species. So I'll just touch base for you. Barberry, garlic mustard, bittersweet, leafy spurge, glossy buckthorn and privet, honeysuckle, common reed, knotweed, porcelain berry, and the multiflora rose, and most of all, the mugwort. All are, here, all are now here to stay. Removing them is not a possibility. It's too late, too costly. They also change the microclimate and the soil and will have long-term consequences which we don't yet know. Maybe that's a little too depressing, but I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much for coming.